we're entering a study on biblical church membership. So what I want to do is to go back in that first century. Let's say the first century, right, from 1 AD to 99 AD, we're going to get right at the New Testament teaching from God himself what is a biblical church membership. Sadly, we're in 2023, and the church has been wandering away from Christ's revelation of church governing and membership. One of the reasons for that is, folks, is if anyone knows our human nature and our propensity, we all want to be chiefs and no Indians, right? Is that the way it usually works? And God's word sets it right. And that's what we're going to learn today. This area clearly needs a reformation and a right understanding of membership because membership is a commitment. But it's a commitment to Christ and it's a commitment to his body, the fellow believers. For the purpose, right, of making disciples who think, look, and act, in a word, own the name of Christian, a follower of Christ. Biblical church doesn't make you followers of a church, of a denomination, or of a pastor. It's got to direct you to Christ. We have to see ourselves as a team, as a family, but most of all, we're purchased with the very precious blood of Jesus Christ, which means we are no longer our own. We're no longer, as we take on the name Christian, we're not independents. We're not self-ruled. We're not self-governed. As we saw in Romans, he says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. So this study is geared to unchurch and de-church the church. The word un, U-N, is a prefix which, meaning, which means not. So what is not church and D church, D means away from, a reversal and a removal. So what we have to do is, we have to look at the scripture, right? See what it says in its context. See the mindset of the Holy Spirit as revealed in his word to understand that we have to get rid of the prejudices, the misguiding, the misleading churchianity. We have to get back to Christianity, back to that word. And the first thing what I want to clear up is this. The church is not hierarchical. Hierarchy implies a top-down subjection of subordinates. That's not what eldership, Presbyterianism is. Hierarchical churches tend to be your United Methodist Church, or the Roman Catholic Church, hierarchy, what the leadership does and says and puts together, you're bound to agree. The Church of England and also independent churches tend to be hierarchical. Hierarchy takes the crown off the head of Christ and puts it on men. Dewey Roberts, who was one of the men God used to move out of the PCA, and to form Vanguard, PCA went to this hierarchical structure. And the danger of that is you start to begin to follow the preaching, the eldership, and their direction. And for Vanguard, the direction has to come from the head of the church, which isn't us. It's Jesus Christ, which means we're going to his word. Hierarchy also leads to liberalism. Liberalism in doctrine, and it also destroys the evangelistic and revivalistic fervor. That's a quote from Dewey. Churches that are hierarchical are all about them. It's not all about Christ. So to make disciples, to go out and to share people with the gospel from Scripture, it's not there. They'll utilize people for their own purposes, and they'll try to win you over with their own ideas, but if we're going to seek to honor God, right, and to glorify him, what better way to honor God and glorify him than doing it by his word? 
Hierarchical churches cause the congregation to trust them, not the scripture. They tend to call that eldership or leadership bullying over its congregation. Hierarchy tends to use the worldly standard of a CEO, a chief executive officer. Uh, it's a model composed of a few pastors, staff members, and a few ruling elders with other leaders just to rubber stamp their own agenda. Elders or Presbyterianism in Scripture is non-hierarchical, as we will see. The church government does not originate with the church courts, how the church defines it. Remember, church government does not originate with the church court. It doesn't originate in a synod, in a meeting of a bunch of people saying, how could we define a church? The local elders, the session, the presbytery, or the general assembly, they are bound to define church government and church membership as defined in the word, not by what they think or what they want it to be. Christ is the one who gives that power to believers as they are united together into a local church. This principle mitigates the wrong idea that a church power is hierarchical top to bottom. The power of the church is vested in the whole body. Thus those who govern, notice that, those who govern receive their authority to do so from those who are governed. We get our authority from you. A matter of fact, you know, Norman, we're working with Norman, who's going to be um, an elder, and, and John Leonetti, and I'm, you know, here as the church planter, but it's the body of Christ that has to hire us, to vote us in. The power is invested in you. Our task is to make many theologians. People who know their scriptures, who are grounded, who cannot be deceived. Presbyterian church government operates through elected elders who govern in assembled church courts. Presbytery has proved friendly to all true rights of man. It has advanced both civil and religious liberty. Our government runs by representation. We represent you. Those who rule the church, whether teaching elders or ruling elders, are both alike chosen by you all. Your leaders are responsible to you, the body of Christ. Submission to our leaders is not total. It is only an ex as extensive as obedience to Christ requires of us. We submit to our leaders only to the extent that such obedience does not require us to disobey Jesus Christ. Obedience isn't, you know, some churches, in independent churches, there's no right to appeal. So when you see the abuse of power, you either have to pick up your bags and move on and find another church because there's no right to appeal. And some of the independent churches, some have what I call the Archie Bunker aspect that all women are to submit to every man in the church. I don't know if you ever heard of that, right? All right, the church is not about Archie Bunker. <laughs> all right, a matter of fact, as we unfold this entire study, it's actually a submission to each one of us. It's a submission to each one of us. Your leaders cannot impose anything contrary or not revealed by Christ in his scripture. And the local church can effectively file a complaint with the higher court, the regional presbytery, against any abuse of power in your local church. We are accountable. Now, where do we get that idea from? Scripture. Paul could call out Peter. Independent churches, you can't do that. And final, the mission of the church is to establish the rule of Christ on this earth. That's the mission of the church. The mission of the church is to establish the rule of Christ on this earth, not to become like the world. Martin Lloyd-Jones often taught that the church is only attractive to the world when it is different than the world. So let's take a look 
at Romans 12, and we're going to key it on verses 4 and 5. He starts off in verse 3, the Apostle Paul, he says, For by the grace given to me, now notice, something was given to him. For by the grace given to me, he says, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. That goes for leaders. It goes for everybody. But to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith God has assigned to each of us. Then he says this, notice in verse 4, for as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. Last week we talked about the hand, the feet, the arms. We're all one body. See, we have to think we're one body. Pride can get in the way, and we have to guard against pride. That's why the Holy Spirit sees it necessary not to think of yourself more highly. Just because one may have a degree from Westminster Theological Seminary doesn't mean the one who graduated from North Haven High School in 1980 is different, you see? And if you think that way, there's pride. So when he says, as in one body we have many members and the members do not all have the same function. There's distinctions. I'll give you an example. When we work for a company, is our boss or the leader, is, he, is the boss, he or she, better than us or just greater by position? Greater by position. Not better, why? Same nature. All right, same thing here. I have the same nature, John. We all have the same nature. See, we're all human beings. He says, uh, and as we look at this, he says, so we, though many are one body of Christ, individually members one of another, we have to start thinking, okay, I'm going to sharpen the iron of this other brother and sister. I'm going to help them. We're all on the same team. We're all on the same journey. So we all work and strive together for each other. This idea of being one body of many members. Look at verse 5. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, what joins us together is the fact that we are united to a person, Jesus Christ. That's what joins us together. It's him. And this is a teaching that's throughout the New Testament. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 10, 17. The Holy Spirit says through Paul, because there is one bread, we, now notice we, does that exclude the author of the letter? He's in the letter, right? Because there is one bread, we, who are many, are one body. Notice there's no hierarchy there. For we all partake of what? One bread. So again, think of this. There is one bread, we who are many, are one body. 1 Corinthians 12, 12, 14 to 20. 1 Corinthians 12, 12, 14 to 20. For just as the body is one, and has many members. Now, we just heard that in Romans. We're hearing it in Corinth. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. And that's key. So it is with Christ. If you're united to Christ, you're not confined to just this local church. For in one spirit... We were all baptized into one body. Whether Jew or Greek, slave or free, all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. So you see this continuity. And then he says in verse 20, as it is, there are many parts, yet one body. He's sending this home. He wants us to see this. 
in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 to 23. That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly place. This power that God worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, he seated him at the right hand of the heavenly places far above all rule and authority, power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. There's, and he put all things under his feet. And he gave him, the Father gave him as head over all things to the church. So who is the head of the church? Jesus Christ. He is king of the church. He directs the church. And then he says this. He gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. In Ephesians 4, 25. We see it in Romans, we see it in Corinth, we're going to see it in Ephesians 4, 25. He says, therefore, having put away falsehood, speaking to the people, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, Here's the reason. For we are members one of another. In Ephesians 5, 23 to 30. 23 and verse 30. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body. And he himself, its savior. So who's the church's savior? Jesus Christ. Look at verse 30. Because we are members of his body. What unites us, folks, is our common repentance and faith in Jesus Christ that unites us to Christ. That's why when we had the membership vows this morning, the, the, the earlier it, before, you notice how it's centered on the repentance, the fact that you're a new creation, your faith in Christ, and the fact that you're going to follow him. Colossians chapter 124. He says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Paul says, And in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. See, what Paul is doing as he's suffering, he's showing what the body of Christ will ultimately suffer for the purpose and cause of Jesus Christ. Christ said, you're not above the teacher. If the master suffered, you will suffer. Why? Because you're standing for a person, not an ideology, not a philosophy, not an organization, a person. Jesus Christ. And in Colossians 2.19, he says, And not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with the growth that is from God. Who enables us to grow? He enters our head, right? Grants us wisdom. Works through every part of the body of Christ. Again, for the purpose of not promoting the church. It's about presenting Jesus Christ. And in the next several weeks, we're going to go over these passages in its context to see this membership, this body, what it looks like. Because in essence, as we engage people around us, we want to unchurch and de-church all the misinformation and some of the bad things that they've saw in have seen in churches. You know, I hear many times of the church bully who comes in, sweeps everything around for why? And then ultimately, you have to follow that leader. We have to follow Christ. 
That's the way to honor Jesus Christ and to glorify him. So in closing, as we close with the Romans 12 passage, he, when he says in verse 4, for as in one body we have many members, the members do not all have the same function, so we, and I want to emphasize again the we, though many are one body in Christ, remember, Paul includes himself with the church at Rome, with the church in Corinth, just to show it's non-hierarchical. The offices are different. The responsibilities are different. Verse 6, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. That's a clear reminder, folks, that none of us went to a school to learn a gift. You can't learn a gift. It's given. And God builds a body by bringing in certain people, gifts them for the work of ministry, for one purpose— Bad church, everybody wants to brag. I could do this and I could do this. That's not one body. That's not being together. And next week as we go through Romans 12, 9 to 21, we're going to see the functionality of the body and some of the admonitions, exhortations that the apostle one of us. Because he says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Now, last week I talked about if prophecy in proportion to our faith. Verse 7, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching. Notice how the Lord puts a body together that glorifies him. The one who exhorts in his exhortation. The one who contributes in generosity. The one who leads with zeal. The one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. This is a new church plan. I think this is our 23rd week. Our 23rd week. And as I see the Lord's hand in what he's doing here, and I could almost see what's happening on the outside of this from people that are coming in, we should be humbled. We should be thankful but should also ignite a flame in us, right? To say, hey, I'm serving the king. I don't serve Pastor Mark. As a matter of fact, I'm only the church planter, <laughs> you know? But our task is we have people that are being misguided with fake news, conspiracy theories, everything shakable. You got churches no different from the first, second, and third century. Everybody's trying to make you follow them. Jesus himself warns us. Many will come in my name trying to make people to follow them. No, let's get back to following him. Amen?